Get out the insurance cards, get out the co-pays. The office is open, my friends. Brought to you by DrRoto.com. What is up and welcome into a, another special off-season edition. We are the one and done show. We are your fast break of college basketball information. I am your host, Eric Romoff. You can catch me on those Twitter streets. You can do your part in this enterprise. Scroll on over and hit those like and subscribe buttons. Specifically, hit the subscribe button. We're like three or four away from 200. It's a big milestone for us. Definitely goes a big way in helping the channel but that is not the reason why we are here. We are here to talk about some college hoops. Joining us, as always, is the captain of our ship, Mr. Mike Holland, MC Holland 34 on Twitter. Mike, how's it going this evening? We are about a month away. I can't believe it. Yeah, it's going good, man. This is my favorite part of the year. I mean, we've got you know basketball on the horizon. NBA is like, what, 10 days away or so? I mean, college basketball is almost 30 days away. We're getting into the middle of NFL, college football in the middle of that baseball playoffs are starting so yeah it's an exciting time I, it's my favorite time of the year october november so uh definitely looking forward to it and the weather's cooler which is nice because you know down here in texas we sit through 100 degree weather all the time so uh yeah but you know as we said we're about a month away uh, from the season tipping off um i think we'll leave november 7th is that official tip for most teams um, we still have a top 20 countdown that's going on our social media platforms jay heinrich our partner has been doing a great job with those and we're still breaking down the major conferences, you know, as we're set to hit the SEC next. Uh, but really why we're here on today's show is to talk about some big 10 hoops. And we got one of the best to help us out. Uh, he's a sports guy for the Lafayette Journal and Courier, which covers Greater Lafayette and Purdue University as part of the USA Today Network. Uh, his work includes Purdue basketball, which has been one of the most successful teams of the Big Ten during the Matt Painter era. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce our guest on today's show. It's Mike Carmen. Mike, how are you today? Uh, great. How are you guys? We are doing well, and we're definitely looking forward to getting a little bit closer to this Purdue program. You know, looking back to last season, uh, before we before we jump forward to the season to come, uh, you know, really wanted to get your thoughts. Coach Painter and these Boilermakers had kind of a roller coaster season. It was his 17th year. Uh, at a point, they were ranked number one in the polls. Then they ended up finishing third in the Big Ten and made their way to the Sweet 16, but they were bounced by a historic loss to the uh, to the St. Peter's Peacocks. So kind of an up and down season. Just want to know from your point of view, Mike, you know, how do you make sense of it? How would you describe this to someone that maybe wasn't following game by game for the Boilermakers? Well, there was a lot of uh, promise for this team uh, going into the year with Jade Nivey, who ended up being a, a lottery pick. And everybody kind of knew that's where he would end up. Uh, you had Travion Williams, who probably one of the more skilled players in program history for a big man was coming off the bench. Um, they, they had all the pieces in place to get to the final four. Um, but they, you know, they didn't, and, you know, and they didn't really win anything last year, no big 10 championship, no big 10 tournament championship. And they didn't get the big prize of, uh, of getting to the final four. So it was somewhat, uh, a disappointing finish, uh, at any time you lose to a 15 seed in the NCAA tournament, it's going to be, it, it's going to be disappointing. That the, you know, the the feeling is that they should have should have gotten something out of last year. They did win a tournament in Connecticut in November, but that that doesn't uh, really count. I mean, they had a lot of had a lot of depth on the team, a lot of talent on the team, uh, but for you know variety, variety of reasons, uh, the lack of attention to detail on defense. Uh, some sloppy ball handling uh, and some other things. They were they were a little bit un Purdue like uh, because Purdue prides itself on the defensive end, and usually their game goes through the defensive end. Last year's team was so built on offense, uh, and their game was dictated by their offense. And when their offense didn't click at the level that it did, uh, especially in November and early December. Uh, the defensive part got away from them. So, you know, as you look to this year, getting some of those defensive principles back, uh, not playing through your offense as much, um, those are things I think people are, are eager to see, you know, how this team responds to that, even though they've, they've got a bit of a different cast. Uh, but how do they get back to some Purdue things that have, has made Purdue successful over the years? 
Yeah, so kind of want to jump forward a little bit here. Now we've obviously gone through the offseason. Um, you mentioned this team loses some firepower. Jaden Ivey, uh, Trevion Williams, one of my favorite players to cover last year. Uh, but like a lot of the Big Ten, there's a lot of big-time scorers going out the door, um, so setting up a, a lot of new things. One one thing we are getting back for Purdue basketball is Zach Eady, um, averaged 14-7 in less than 20 minutes a game last year, says – Coach Payne, you're going to unleash Edie this year, and how do you think the big man's going to respond to uh, what should be rising expectations? Well, I mean, you're going to have to define unleash. Uh, I mean, he's going to start. He's going to play. Now, how many minutes he plays, there, there's, there was a, um, a feeling in the offseason that Zach needed to increase his minutes to 25, 26, 27, and, and, and he may end up there. Uh, and he's probably in a better position to end up there uh, this year. Uh, and they're going to play through the post with Zach on the floor because, you know, you have to. He's 740. He's very skilled. Um, and there's probably better numbers that he can put up uh, just because he's another year older. Um, you got to remember, he's still, in the grand scheme of things, still relatively young to playing basketball compared to people that started out playing when they were five or six. He didn't get into basketball until later in his youth life. So he's still got a lot of upside there, but um, a, a lot of is going to depend, you know, how many minutes he can play, but also what happens when he comes off the floor. Um, and there's some interesting dynamics there that could happen with him. But with Zach, uh, he's a force. Uh, he's one of the better players in the Big Ten. As you mentioned, the Big Ten lost a lot of individual talent last year, uh, but Zach comes in and, and fills, fills the void. Um, in a year in the Big Ten where there's not – there's some star power, but there's not as much star power as there was last year. And I think Zach uh, will be one of those stars. He'll be an all-Big Ten performer. He'll be in the running for player of the year. Um, it's just a matter of how efficient he can be on the offensive end. And then defensively, um, not getting caught in some pick and rolls and some, some on-ball situations – where he has to improve. But uh, I think Zach is poised for uh, a really uh, good season, um, in part because the dynamic of the team has changed a little bit. Yeah, we've done a fair amount of uh, covering of Big Ten basketball this offseason, and it is a war of attrition to say the least. And Mike tends to agree with you. He actually has Edie making his first team there in the conference from when we broke down this conference a couple weeks ago. Uh, another group of players that are returning for these Boilermakers, number of guys that all kind of fell into that 10 to 20 minute range, right? Brandon Newman, Ethan Morton, Mason Gillis, Caleb First, right? So nice to have those returning players coming back. You know, um, among that group, Mike, do you see uh, a guy or two that can take a considerable step forward and sort of act as that running mate alongside Edie? Well, I think all all those guys you mentioned will have to take a step forward. They need to take a step forward. Brandon Newman, um, you know, I don't know how many how, how many people are familiar with his uh, his stories and the and the some of the things he went through last year, from you know not starting to not playing to playing at the end. Uh, but he's a guy that if he would buy in defensively, I think he he could become one of the better defenders this program has seen uh, in a while. Ethan Morton is a coach uh, and, you know, Matt Painter told me a few weeks ago that he's, the, he's one guy on his team. And I think there's some others, but he's one guy on the team that he could turn a practice over to Ethan Morton and feel comfortable that he could run the practice like a coach. Uh, he's a, he came to Purdue as a point guard, but he has learned to play multiple positions. Very smart guy. Uh, Painter had labeled him the best passer he'd ever recruited. Um, now we'll see if that holds true, uh, because he's, you know, he had some, some health issues early in his career, but he'll play more minutes. Um, and the fascinating thing to me is with one guy you mentioned, Caleb first, um, and the one guy you didn't mention that, that needs to get mentioned is Trey Kaufman Wren. Uh, he redshirted last year. Um, he has transformed his body. Uh, he's bigger, he's stronger. I think he's a star that's going to really burst out uh, this year in part because, and I want I don't try to get too deep in the weeds here, but when Zach Eady comes off the floor, Purdue's going to go with a lineup that will feature Caleb first, probably at center, 
and Trey Kaufman ran at the four. Well, last year when Zach came off the floor, they put in Travion Williams. You, the ball still went through the post because that's the way – that's how Travion played. This year when Zach Eady comes off the floor, they're going to be more perimeter-oriented. First and Kaufman Wren can take big guys out on the perimeter and hit threes, create more spacing. And I, in a way, I think Purdue will have – Kind of two different teams that they can that, that they they can put out there two different styles, and that's really something something to watch to see how teams adjust to that and see how effective it is. Mason Gillis is the mainstay at the four. He's just a hard nosed guy that defends, rebounds, and will bust your chops uh, if you look at him the wrong way. Um, so they their front court maybe when you when you look at the guys that will play there not just the starters but when you look at the guys that will play there will could be the best in the big 10 the combination of those four guys could be the best in the big 10 uh as we get through this year now i'm sure your next question will be whoa what's going to happen in the front court yeah so i mean <laughs> I, I love the depth i mean i really like mason gillis's game obviously we love Edie. Um, you know, Brandon Newman, you know, I think he's going to take a big step forward just with, uh, you know, all, all the attention that <laughs> Ivy and those guys got last year. So I'm um, looking for big things from him, but let's talk about the transfer portal and, and one guy that's coming in, um, you know, coach Painter and the staff, they were kind of quiet in this department. So David Jenkins, um, obviously had a roller coaster career at Utah. Uh, is he someone you expect to can be a major contributor in the backcourt and be a starter? Yeah, he, he will be. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know right now if he'll start. Um, they were looking for a point guard when this whole process started uh, back in April. And they thought they had one in Nigel Pack from Kansas State who ended up at Miami. And that's, you know, that situation kind of blew up the whole NIL thing, if you remember, where he got a two-year deal for 800 grand um, from, from Miami. And that, that had, that really got the NIL ball rolling. Uh, back in, back in the spring and Purdue, he, you know, Nigel Pack, the first day you could go visit after the NCAA championship game, he was at Purdue. He's from Indianapolis. Purdue thought they had him, but then NIL took over and money talks nowadays in, in that marketplace. And then they looked at uh, Isaiah uh, Hunter from Iowa State. So they, they went through their list. They, you know, they eventually ended with David Jenkins, who's more of a shooter, than a point guard. Um, he's an older guy. He's 24. And that's that's really what Painter liked about him because they've got a lot of young guys on the perimeter. And they're going to have – Jenkins brings a veteran presence there. Uh, the key for them is getting a guy, a veteran guy, that can handle the ball against the press. Anybody that's kind of followed Purdue basketball over the last few years has noticed that they have some struggles uh, when the other teams start to press. Uh, so the, they'll have some experience there to go along with some younger guys. But David Jenkins is, a, you know, if you look at his three point stats from all the places he's been, it's been he's been pretty good, and he'll give them uh, an element uh, of shooting. And really, when you look at this whole roster, uh, it's probably it's going to be one of Purdue's best shooting teams, or it should be Purdue's uh, shooting best, one of their best shooting teams uh, in a long time across the board, not just. Uh, not just a couple players. They've got they've got pure shooters uh, all across the perimeter uh, that could really spread to four and open some more things up inside. So you know, David Jenkins ended up being the addition. Uh, I think he's going to help them in a lot of areas, and uh, you know, I expect him to to play a lot of minutes. I, again, I don't know if he's going to start right now, but he'll, he'll play a lot of minutes. Man, with uh, just how prolific we're expecting Ed to be on the interior, if they can add uh, some outside shooting, it, it certainly feels like uh, a, a formula for a very fun team to watch. So we'll, we'll definitely keep our, our eye on that. Kind of the the last piece of this puzzle as we are putting together the roster that will be here in the next 30 days is this incoming recruiting class. It's a solid little class, uh, ranked 29th by 24-7 composite, 24-7 composite. Uh, three man class. It's it's headlined by Fletcher Lawyer as kind of the you know the the national one hundred type player coming in. So, as as you look at this class, Mike, is there anyone that could potentially step forward as an X factor or be counted on to play early on in the season? Uh, I think Braden Smith, uh, Indiana's Mister Basketball, will be in contention to start at point guard. Uh, 
he, he's kind of an overlooked uh, guy, um, but he, he he's a prototypical Purdue recruit. Tough nose, uh, very, very plays very hard. We'll, we'll get into your grill defensively, um, and he's a very good passer. Uh, he understands where the ball needs to be. Uh, it's just a matter of can a freshman hold up in the Big Ten um, against the the size and strength that he's going to see on a on a nightly basis. Now he won't have to do it alone, and that's in a way it's it's the beauty of what Purdue has with its roster. They have a lot of guys on the perimeter, so not one guy is going to have to shoulder all the responsibility of being the point guard. You know, if you remember last year, Jaden Ivey technically wasn't their point guard. But when he got a defensive rebound, he became their point guard. And I think you'll see some of that, like from Brandon Newman uh, and some other guys that can get Purdue into its offense. But uh, I, I expect a lot of minutes from Braden Smith uh, in that class. Fletcher Lawyer can also play the point guard. Uh, he's very, very heady and can, can handle the ball very well. He's a, uh, he's a coach's son. Uh, actually covered his mother in high school because she grew up in Lafayette. Uh, way, 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 way back in the day. So uh, he's got the genes to do it, and he and he is an excellent shooter. Uh, if he's if he's going to get open looks, he's going to he's going to knock him down. He's got he's got all the skill there uh, to get that done. So I, I think their freshman class is going to is going to contribute. Now uh, the big guy from Sweden, he's probably on track to redshirt as of right now, unless there's some injuries uh, that are, that are going to that that happen. But lawyer and Braden Smith are are definitely part of the rotation, and you'll see them a lot this year. Yeah, I'm excited to see both of those guys. I um, think they got a lot of ability, and we'll be able to see that on a nightly basis. But, you know, we talk about um, the offensive side of the ball. I mean, this is seven straight years inside the top 50 offensive efficiency, but you talked about it a little bit. One of the things that kept this team down last year was the drop in defensive efficiency. So um, do you think the way this roster is constructed that defensively this team's going to be a lot better than they were last year? Well, they, they have to be. I mean, I don't think Panner can go through another year of what what he endured last year. Now, a lot of their defensive problems uh, came when they turned the ball over and they got caught in transition. They always had either Zach Eady or Travion Williams on the floor for most of the time. There were, there were only a few minutes throughout the whole course of the year that those two were not on the floor. So when you get when you turn the ball over at the free throw line, Zach Eady and Travion Williams were already at a disadvantage. And there were a lot of, you know, if I can use the hockey ter- term, odd man advantages for the opposing teams. Uh, like they were on their own little power play uh, with Purdue in transition. So the big guys could not get back enough to help. And when they turned the ball over, they became, you know, live ball turnovers. And that and that's when they got, they got caught in transition. Overall, they just need to keep their turnovers down. And if they do that, they'll, they'll be better defensively. But there are some, some things in the half court that they have to do better. They've got to rotate better. They've got to handle the, the on-ball screens better. Uh, they just have to be better defensively, and they have to buy in defensively. They can't, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Purdue teams do not play through their offense most times. They play through their defense. And last year's team, for the most part, played through its offense. If this team gets back to playing through its defense – uh, it, it will see probably more success and be in a position in a wide open Big Ten, in my opinion, to to be there at the end to contend for the regular season championship. So we uh, we talked a little bit earlier about Nigel Pack and not being able to compete with you know roughly a million dollar bag. <laughs> Wanted to get a sense from you, Mike. How uh, how is this team navigating the new NIL landscape? Has there been anything that surprised you? about the approach that the, the program's taken thus far? Uh, no, uh, Purdue uh, Purdue does things a certain way uh, and it's methodical and it's thought out. Uh, and they're, they're now in a position, however many months later, to, to be in that space. They have a collective of their own out of Indianapolis, the Boilermaker Alliance. They have other things going on. Um, they're, they're more, they can be more competitive in that space, but there's only so much that Purdue fans and Purdue donors are, are going to be willing to do. They, they do not, they do not want this to turn into an inducement. Um, and 
the other question for Purdue fans is, is there enough of them to support what the Alliance and the collectives want to do uh, and also support the fundraising arm of the athletic department. Uh, they've got a $45 million football renovation coming up that they'll need some money for. And then after that, they've got another $40 million renovation that they're looking at. So uh, Purdue's, Purdue's going to be competitive in this space and um, their, their players are going to, to get paid, but they're going to have to do stuff to get paid, you know, charity work and some other things. It's just not a handout. Some schools are just handing money out. Purdue's never going to be that way, and their donors don't want to be that way. So they're, they're going to be competitive. And, and as of right now, and I know we're really early into the NIL game, it hasn't, you know, other than Nigel Pack and maybe a couple other transfers that they were looking at, um, it hasn't really hurt them. And But as time goes on, we'll see, we'll see how this all plays out. And, you know, when it dips into the high school recruiting, part of it is is where I'll be interested to see how Purdue reacts after that. Yeah, the ever-changing landscape of NIL, it's been a, <laughs> it's been a whirlwind to cover. Um, but just before we get you out of here, Mike, I want to get your thoughts. The Big Ten, you kind of mentioned it's wide open this year. I mean, Indiana uh, returns a lot of talent. They kind of seem like the cream of the crop, but there's a bunch of schools with a wide range of outcomes. So just want to get your thoughts on how you see this conference shaking out and who are some of your favorites and uh, what does this uh, Purdue squad have to do to secure that regular season title? Well, I, I, I participate in a, uh, in a media poll uh, for, for big 10 basketball. And I did my rankings last week and uh, I, I, you know, full disclosure, I put Indiana at the top, not all the way by default, but as you mentioned, they've got enough guys coming back that they've probably, put themselves in a position to get a preseason ranking. But after that, it was a let's draw them out of a hat because they lost, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, they lost so much star power. The league did that you're looking for, okay, who's, who's, who's the best guy on, who's the best player on this team. Who's the best player on that team. Uh, it was very, very hard. And I, I've told people, I said, um, this is a year that Purdue wins the big time because they're not going to be picked number one. They're probably going to be in the middle of the pack because of what they lost. But this is the kind of year where they go out and win the Big Ten because no one expected them to. But when you start looking at other teams uh, that could be up there, Illinois has kind of revamped its whole roster. It's more of a transfer situation than it is, you know, high school recruiting. You know, that's that's the way the sport is nowadays. You know, you can never overlook Ohio State, but there's no one on the roster that really jumps out at you. Uh, right now. Michigan's added some pieces. They have Hunter Dickinson back, but, you know, what else do they have there? You know, Michigan State's still Michigan State, but they've got some holes to fill. Iowa's got, you know, the Murray kid, uh, but what else do they have to go with him? And he's a bit unproven. How can he play without his brother on the floor? I could, The only two certainties for me were Indiana at the top and Nebraska at the bottom. And then everything in between was just <laughs> okay, where does this team fit? Where does that team fit? And how's I'm going to be scared to death at the end of the year to go back and look and see how awful my selections were because <laughs> this is probably the hardest year to put a 1 through 14 uh, ranking together for the Big Ten because there are, just, there are just so many unknowns. And the transfer market, you look at their numbers, what they did at their other school, but how do they fit in in the Big Ten? How do they fit in with the team that they're on? I think there's some potential there for some guys to step up and, and be a factor. But, I mean, there's just so many unknowns in the Big Ten right now that it's 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 a little bit scary. And I can't remember a year, at least in recent memory, that it's that it's been like this. Mike Carmen absolutely dialed in to all things Purdue basketball, to all things Purdue, to be fair. If you are not already, get over to Twitter and follow him so you can find all of his work. It's at Carmen underscore JC. It's going along the bottom there. You can also find all of his written work over at jconline.com. Mike, really appreciate you taking some time out of your evening and getting us up to speed on all things Boilermakers. Thanks for reaching out. Thanks for having me. How much do I owe you for all this promotion? <laughs> Nothing, my Not friend. We appreciate we, we it. Walk Thank away you so much. Educated yes. on this team and on the Big Ten, and we would love to do it again as we as we get the ball into the air and, and get some game action. In well, just w when we get to midseason, don't look back and say that guy was completely wrong. And 
<laughs> that's that's that college basketball, college. man. <laughs> the name of the game. Right, really appreciate you, it, Mike. Man. Thank you. All right, Mike. So we have a bit of catching up to do on the rest of the happenings around college basketball. One of those things is a name that we talked about not that long ago. Uh, just a few short days ago, we were looking at a uh, indefinite suspension for Xavier forward, Zach Fremantle. He is now back on the court. What's going on there with uh, with Fremantle? Yeah, I just felt like, uh, oh, man, Rody's excited that Fremantle's back Rudy. on the court. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I guess we don't really have much news. I mean, you don't get many details about the incident. He's been reinstated back with the team. Um, but now Xavier fills whole. So, uh, yeah, he's obviously going to be a big factor into them making the NCAA tournament as you know, him and Nunji um, create one of the better front courts in the, uh, the Big East. So what were your thoughts on the reinstatement? Yeah, I think this is one of those things that's just going to be kind of like a black box forever, right? Like it happened. We're probably not going to get a whole lot of details on what happened. Um, but ultimately, we are here now. And the point that you put forward is is the one that is most important, right? This this combination of Nunji and Fremantle is a really strong pairing in the Big East. So Xavier, back to what looks to be close to full strength and will be a fun team to watch. Florida State is another team I want to talk about. Looks like they're uh, they're shuffling the deck a little bit with their with their front court. Yeah, man, man, Florida State this cannot catch a break recently. I mean, they were <laughs> ravaged by injuries last year; it was out of control. And now we get news that uh, Jalen Ganey, the transfer from Brown, um, who averaged nine and six last year, was supposed to help this front court out is going to miss the year with a knee injury. So big bummer there. And now we hear, um, you know, talk of Cam Fletcher, um, one of the guys that we covered a lot last year and one of the guys that we had as a breakout candidate, um, potentially playing some small ball five and some of that four spot, which is going to be super interesting. Um, I still think this thing is going to run through Baba Miller, who's the five-star freshman, um, you know, real lanky, but can block shots. I think they're going to have to use him a ton at that five spot. But, you know, Cam Fletcher at that five, he's a wiry uh, three, four man. So we'll see if he can hold it down. What are your thoughts on Fletcher and kind of this front court shaking out for Florida State? Man, this this one's tough because, like, it, Fletcher felt like he would fit in as, like, nicely as, like, a, a secondary piece or a change of pace piece. If, if he's going to be a small ball five in, in this conference and have to, you know, go out and face off against guys like – Baycott, like like you, Lee, right? Like I, I think I think it's gonna be kind of a, a rough go for him. Um, you know, ultimately, but like you said, maybe he ends up being a mismatch, but um I, I think that's probably not gonna be the case, at least at first. So it'll take him a little bit of time to to get his sea legs uh in uh going up against some of those uh those big bodies there in, in the conference. The last team that we want to touch on, Villanova got a bit of injury news. What's uh, what's the latest with the Wildcats, Mike? Yeah, so the you know all these teams are kind of introducing, I'm um, doing their. Um, you know, this one was called the Hoops Mania event at Vill Villanova, and we got news that Caleb Dan uh, Caleb Daniels is out um, with a broken nose, and Brandon Housen um, out with a concussion. So uh, they didn't uh, participate in this event. You know, I mean, Daniels is going to be a key part of this team, um, and you know this team's now not going to be without you know Jay Wright. So you know Kyle Neptune um, in his first year. Uh, obviously a broken nose. We've seen guys wear masks, plays through that. We're still 30 days away, so he should be fine. Um, but just a little concerning just with everything that they've had going on. So uh, what's your takeaway? Yeah, I mean, this this team was really depending on Daniels to to take a pretty big step forward with Gillespie heading out with Justin Moore's injury, right? So um, but like you said, I, I think we've got enough time to where it probably doesn't impact his his play on the floor. I, I do I do love the idea of him trotting out there with the mask. Like even after his nose heals, um, would love to see him just stick with the mask and have that be part of the the persona for him. Um, but ultimately, he he does need to step up in absence of Gillespie, who's out, and and Moore, who's uh, probably not going to be seen for the majority of the season as he comes back from injury. So that is the latest from around college basketball. Like we said off the top. About 30 days out, in a month's time or so, we will be watching live game action. It is going to be a ton of fun. I know that Mike and I are feeling super plugged in and ready for the season to start. I feel like we're going to take advantage of an early season edge. And if you want to take advantage of that early season edge, best thing to do, get yourself over to drrotor.com. Get yourself subscribed. You can find 
all of Mike's written work over there and really comb through all of the detail that he put together over the course of this off season. It also gets you into our members only discord where you can chat with experts like Mike, like myself, anytime that you want. We're in there talking about lineups. We're in there talking about games you want to target. We're in there talking about prop bets that we think can be taken advantage of. Ultimately, getting into that members-only Discord is the best way for you to get this bread. Thanks for stopping by the office. Get your fantasy prescription by subscribing to the channel and checking out drrodo.com. And until the next visit, be well and take care.